Hey, Professor. Mm, great jerky. My God, this is an outrage. I was going to eat that mummy. Welcome to The Internet Says It's True, a show where we learn something new every week, part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name is Michael Kent, and this topic is disgusting. We're going to combine Egyptology with cannibalism this week and talk about another thing that sounds made up, but it's totally true. As always, please consider supporting this podcast by signing up for Patreon. You can join at three different levels, the smallest level just being $1 a month. It's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. And when you do that, you're able to watch videos and content that I don't put anywhere else, including 60 episodes of Joke Story Trick, which is my web show where I interview B and C level celebrities and then I tell jokes. Now, let's get on to this week's topic, which comes to us from Rob. Hey, Michael, it's Rob. I recently learned that people in England used to eat mummies. It is imperative that you get to the bottom of this. Does the internet say it's true? That is a great question, Rob, and thank you for the call. As I said, this one is gross, but I find it super interesting. I spent the week learning about it. Let's get into it. There's an 1815 painting by Martin Drolling that hangs in the Louvre. It's an interior painting of two women and a child sitting in the light of an open window. The women are sewing, and a child is on the tiled floor playing. The painting, called Interior of a Kitchen, is filled with dull earth tones, browns, and reds, and one of the notable colors in this painting is called Mummy Brown. It's a particular shade of brown that was very desirable at the time and very difficult to come by, because it wasn't just the color of mummies, it was made from mummies. Mummy Brown had a certain transparency and shine to it that was popular for depicting windows and shadows, and it was sold all the way up until 1930. The pigment used ground flesh of actual mummies mixed with other chemicals to create a paint that was known to all artists of the time. In addition to Mummy Brown, it's even rumored that Drawling used the blood from the hearts of monarchs to create some of the red hues in the painting, but that fact is disputed. Today we're mostly going to talk about mummies and why there aren't more of them. Now when this topic comes up, there's usually an exaggerated statement like, quote, there would be way more mummies if people in Victorian England didn't eat them, end quote. And that's not really true. There's no evidence that the total number of mummies would be huge if it weren't for this particular type of desecration, and we'll get to that later. But yes, people ate mummies. As early as 5000 BC, humans were deliberately mummifying their dead. And while scientists have discovered naturally mummified human remains throughout history, we're talking specifically about people that were deliberately mummified, which is most commonly associated with Egypt. Mummification was a part of normal life and death in Egypt for both rich and poor Egyptians. And there's something about the way that people were mummified that was interesting to scientists and doctors in Victorian England. The flesh of the mummies was dark, almost black. Put a pin in that and we'll come back to it in a minute. A little backstory. Ancient scholars and medicine men used a substance called bitumen to treat a whole assortment of ailments and to protect plants from insects and used it as bookbinding. It was a dark, sappy, tar-like substance that formed in the Middle East from decayed plants and animals. In Persia, it was known as mumia from the word mum, meaning wax and they referred to this bitumen tar as mumia when they used it for medicinal purposes. Even Pliny the Elder, the famous Roman author and naturalist, mentions using bitumen to treat coughs and dysentery. Scientists later discovered that there is indeed some antimicrobial properties to bitumen, and it contains sulfur, which is a biocidal agent. So it makes sense that when preserved Egyptian remains were discovered and appeared to be covered in this dark, waxy substance, they believed it to be bitumen. And because bitumen was known as mumia, that's where we get the word mummies. Now there's some dispute as to whether any of the flesh of the mummies actually contained any bitumen. Some of it may have been, especially earlier mummies, but not all of it. Most of the waxy black surface of mummified flesh was just the result of the mummification process and wasn't bitumen at all. Well, just like any natural resource, naturally occurring bitumen from the ground was becoming more and more rare. And, even if they were mistaken, the people who found these mummies had found a possible newfound source. It was around this same time that the actual definition of mumia began to change to include not only naturally occurring decayed material, but that taken of a preserved body. 
I think it's probably easy to see at this point where this is going. Along with heroin for cough syrup, tobacco for headaches, and mercury for STDs, people started to believe that eating small bits of ground mummy flesh could be beneficial to their health. It was a very strange and disconnected form of what's known as medical cannibalism. There was a time when King Charles II of England sipped what he called, quote, the king's drops, and it was his own personal tincture that was made up of ground human skull suspended in alcohol. In the 1600s, a scientist named Thomas Willis believed that if you ground up a human skull and mixed it with chocolate, you could cure apoplexy. In Germany, doctors used human fat soaked in bandages to treat wounds. Can you imagine that? Using someone else's fat for your health? I'll be back with more after a quick break. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing bombs, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. Everything is impermanent. Nothing lasts forever. And if you want to enjoy life, you've got to take a leap and live in the moment. One Week Tees is a new t-shirt company that takes that idea to heart. Every week they release a fun new design on a t-shirt, then they permanently retire it after one week. If you don't jump on it, you miss out on it forever. So in effect, every t-shirt they sell is limited edition. At noon every Monday, the new design gets released and the old one goes away. It's a pretty great idea, especially if you want to have a shirt that you can almost guarantee no one else will have. Check out One Week Tees on Facebook and Instagram to see their new design each week. It's the number one week tease. Or check out their website at oneweektees.com. And because you listen to this podcast, use the promo code INTERNET to get 10% off your order. The link is in the show notes. I've been traveling again lately, and that means I've been wearing my Scotty Vest jacket, which is awesome for anyone who sort of lives life on the go like I do. It's been awesome for traveling around because it's got tons of pockets for all my gadgets, my phone, my glasses, my wallet, my charging cord, you name it. It's a clothing company I believe in, and I'm confident they've got an article of clothing that you'll love. The best thing you can do is take a look at all the awesome pocket-packed clothing on their website. To get 15% off your order, visit the link in the show notes. Let's get back to the story. In Victorian England, consuming blood and tinctures made from ground human bone were up to date with the science and the beliefs of the time. It wasn't considered some sort of strange medicine. It's interesting to think about the fact that at this very same time, Protestants were persecuting Catholics for their belief in transubstantiation, and they thought it was outrageous that Catholics believed that they were drinking the blood and eating the flesh of Jesus. And here at the same time, people were consuming blood, fat, skull, and flesh of the dead for their health. Some of the health benefits that they believed consuming mummy powder would provide was vitality, protection against illness of the liver and spleen, curing paralysis, and the list goes on and on. It was like a snake oil of the time. So where did these mummies come from? Gentlemen, you're hired. We're sending you to bring back the mummy of King Rutentutin. You leave immediately for Cairo. See, I got an uncle in Cairo. He's a chiropractor. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, it turns out the mummy trade was big business. English, Spanish, French, and Germans began working in the mummy importing and exporting business. Sometimes they'd buy and sell complete bodies. Sometimes it would just be fragmented pieces of mummified flesh. But as soon as this business arose, that meant that Egyptian tombs were also raided. Some were raided and stolen for display as oddities in museums, but many were raided and ground into powder for medicine and paint. Now there's this idea that we would have a ton more mummies if the Victorians didn't eat them, and I've seen that argued, but I've also seen it argued that it's not necessarily true. Dr. Sarah Parsak is an Egyptologist and author, and she says in a Twitter thread, quote, Mummies are not rare because people ate them. A. Mummies are found all the time. See all media of mummies found. B. 
Mummies were used for paint plus as medicine in the 19th century, but there is a huge mythology around them. Countless mummies were lost to unethical mummy wrappings and were used as fertilizer. How many mummies were used for mumia? We cannot quantify. Only a small percentage of mummies lost compared to other reasons. Also, if mummies are so rare, how come my colleagues and I keep finding them? End quote. And then she added a TLDR. Mummies are cool, but learn about them from experts. And I have to say, I am a comedy magician who does a podcast. I'm not an expert, but I did read about this all week, so you don't have to. The practice of using mummies for medicine led to something even more sinister. The selling of fake mummies. People began robbing graves and selling corpses as Egyptian mummies. After all, mummies themselves were an extremely limited resource. Eventually, science proved that there was little benefit to the practice, medically speaking, of consuming mumia powder. So it's partially true. It's true enough to tell people. So if you're ever asked by a child why there aren't mummies anymore, you can look them in the eye and say with a serious face, it's because we ate them. Now it's time for the part of the podcast where I call a friend, and today I'm calling Dr. Andy Luttrell, the host of the Opinion Science Podcast. Andy is a social psychologist and a really interesting guy. His show is about why people hold the opinions they do and how and if those opinions can change. He's also interested in comedy and magic, and that's how I know him. It's so good to have you on the podcast. I've been wanting to bring you on the show for a while. Um, I am a, a big fan of your podcast. Uh, and and you're, you've had your pod, your podcast, the Opinion Science podcast, for a while. How many episodes have you done with that one? I think episode 60 is the one that I just got ready to release. So at least 60 of them have and, been out. And you're finding actual, like, scientists and important people. <laughs> people that you're, you're finding experts in your field for each episode. More or less, yeah. So it's a show about... Um, just it's kind of loosely about the psychology of opinion but it can pull from so many areas so my colleagues in social psychology but also political scientists communication folks political campaign managers film reviewers like anyone who sort of has <laughs> has <insight>. an opinion <laughs> yeah well who has an opinion and an opinion about opinions yeah uh, that's someone who I'd want to talk to that's that's it's really interesting to me uh and and such a relevant topic in today's world, really. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, opinions are the things that are separating society. And it's really interesting to study why people have the opinions that they do. I'm sure you've read the um, the Righteous Minds book, the Jonathan sure. Haidt book, which is such such a great book. I, I recommend it to to everyone who's listening. I'm not sure I agree with Jonathan. Is it Haidt? H-I-Height. Height. H-I-H-A-I-D-T. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I agree with his political opinions, um, but, you know, him being like he's like a hardcore libertarian guy. But this book will help chill you out if you're getting frustrated about your mm. your friends or family not believing the same things you do. Um, and so that's basically the type of thing that you study is why do people believe what they believe? And you're finding I, was, I, I, I give my take my hat off to you because. In the first few episodes of this one, I was trying to find subject matter experts to match up with the episodes, and it was just so much work. Mm. It's so hard to find people who not only know what they're talking about, but are interested in coming on a podcast to talk about it. Yeah, I, I have the advantage of sort of living in the world the podcast is about. So I kind of can always have sort of a roster of things, or I'll see a new paper come out and I go, oh, when I ordinarily would have just said, oh, I guess I'll read this some other day. <laughs> now I go, I better read it today because maybe this person could come on the show and talk about it. Yeah. And while they're like hot on the scenes, good time to catch them. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. And then other times it'll just kind of be like, you know, well, it'd be great to talk to someone who does like national polling and then reach out to the channels. And I end up getting someone from Pew to come on and talk about like, how does Pew get at America's opinions? Um, so, so the episodes can come from all over the place um, and can tell bigger stories even than one interview can cover. Yeah. And it's probably pretty easy to like link to current events, which helps people listen to the podcast, which is great. <laughs> Difficult <laughs> for my show to do that. Um, and since you're a social psychologist, I brought you on to talk about um, history in Victorian England. Oh, so <laughs> yes. That's what my thesis was on. <laughs> <laughs> for this first question, we're playing for a joke. So if you get it right, I have to tell a joke. And if you get it wrong, mm, you have oh, to right. tell me a joke. So which one of these weird things did people eat in Victorian England for its supposed health benefit? 
Now, people ate, I'm sure, a lot of weird things for supposed health benefits. So I've, li- I've limited this to three choices. One of these is definitely something people ate for health. A, mummies. B, wood. Or C, pebbles. So, okay. So now <laughs> you put me into like the mindset of, of the test writer that I am in my like uh, everyday <laughs> job of, you know, mo- these multiple choice questions. So you can guarantee that there's one answer that's right. Yes. But can you guarantee that the other answers are not I. I are, did are quite a bit of Googling on the okay. on the other answers and couldn't <laughs> find anything um, that made headlines, at least. So you'd have uh-huh. to do quite a bit of digging on the two that aren't right. Mm-hmm. I mean, between them, there's one that I there's only one that I could imagine myself eating, which is wood. And, and that's kind of where I'm leaning. I feel like you can't even really eat pebbles. Like part of me thinks in order to be edible, it must be chewable. And I don't think pebbles count. I don't know. I don't know if you would want to push me on that opinion I have about what is edible. (laughs) Uh, Mummies would certainly be edible, but also probably hard to come by and in the volume that you would need to satisfy the nutrient requirements of a society back then. So all all paths lead me to wood. I'm sorry, Andy. The answer is... Hey, mummies. Uh, this is a thing. So this is why this made headlines. And it's if you if you type like weird things that Victorian England ate for health, uh, mummies is one of them. And usually it comes under the headline is uh, of this is why there aren't more mummies, <laughs> because mummies became big business in Victorian England. And uh, they b- would basically ground the flesh and bone mm. of mummy into a powder that would be consumed for all kinds of things. It was basically a snake oil type type deal. And the whole thing had to do with a big misunderstanding in that uh, bitumen was this tar-like substance that did supposedly have some antibiotic type health properties to it. They thought all mummies were covered in bitumen and that's what made them dark tar looking like thing. Mm. Some mummies were usually just the lower class people that were mummified. They used bitumen on them. Bitumen was also hard to come by, uh, but the problem was, you know, a mummies not a um, inexhaustible resource, and b very hard to find. C people started faking mummies by taking by raiding cemeteries and mm. saying other uh, humans were. Well, all you'd so. have to do is fake the powder, though, right? Like, why, why, why <laughs> fake the whole mummy? <laughs> that's a great point. Just that burn is a, something and say this ash was a mummy. Once. That's a good. That's a good point. I suppose it's who's doing the faking. If it's the <laughs> if it, if it's the guy who's making the powder, he's got to make it out of something. <laughs> if it's the person who's selling things to the guy who makes the powder, now he needs a mummy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's a great point. The guy who's making the powder should be the one to fake it. Uh, you know, you just go out, you get a little bit of pepper. <laughs> and you put yeah, it I'm in. sure I have some mummy powder around here somewhere. Yeah, exactly. I could absolutely sell that. Another interesting use for mummies was paint. So they would use mm. this ground mummy powder uh, to make these really shiny and translucent brown hues, which several prominent paintings have mummy powder in mm. them. So uh, you Can owe you me tell a- me what one of those is, or, or is that another question? What's that? What's one of these paintings that has mummy in it? Yeah, it's uh, the guy's name is um, Drolling. It's a French. A French uh, artist drolling, and it's called Interior of a Kitchen. Very famous. <laughs> Hangs in the Louvre. Um, huh. Martin Drolling was the guy's name. Uh, and yeah, it's famous. I think it's probably most famous for this talking point that's very mm. sensational, and that is made mm. with dead people. And mm. rumors that it's also made with blood from the heart of royals. And it's just like a picture of a kitchen, right? Is what it's, you're a, it's a picture of, of two <laughs> women and a baby in a kitchen. Yeah, it is. Uh, there's nothing mummif- mummified about the painting at all. Like it doesn't. It's not a picture of mummies made with mummies. Although that would be very meta. It's uh, it's just a kitchen. Yeah, drolling was very v- famous for for painting interior scenes. I guess. So, do you have a joke for me? So let me set the stage. We're at the airport, right? Airport, and it's specifically O'Hare <laughs> for okay. a detail that does not pan out in any satisfying satisfying way in the end. So we're at O'Hare photon trying to get to uh i'm sorry a photon yeah photon okay. sorry yes yes uh uh physics terminology here photon would like to get to el paso texas so it's rolling through o'hare airport rolls up through tsa um and tsa is like put your bag on the conveyor belt please so that we can check that you don't have knives inside and the photon says oh no don't worry about me i'm traveling light traveling light unbelievable 
Dr. Andy Luttrell, ladies and gentlemen, he'll be here all night. Um, unbelievable detail in that one. And Absolutely. That's, I, as written, as I learned it, that was how the joke was written. I, I, well, I, when you said O'Hare, my body tensed up from my mm. experiences at O'Hare. So I felt like I was there. Mm. So. Good. That, the magic of imagery. <laughs> my heart goes out to friends who are traveling today. It's, it's a tough travel day. I've just learned that uh, Southwest is having some issues today, and I've got lots of friends stranded in airports today. Mm, so yes. uh, today being Sunday, the day before you're listening to this podcast. Uh, all right. So you're 0 for 1, but let's go to question 2. And for this question, we're playing for an admission of something we do well. So if you get it right, you've got to tell mm. us something you're good at. If you get it wrong, I'll tell you something I'm good at. I am very bad at doing this. So this felt like a punishment that would fit the, the like losing or missing the mm-hmm. question. You know what I mean? I don't know how you are about pride and shame. But for me, mm-hmm. saying I'm good at that thing is like, that's like death to me. Uh, mm-hmm. So here we go. Here's your question. In the Egyptian process of mummification, which organ was left inside the body? Mm. Was it A, the brain, B, the genitals, or C, the heart? So can, can I at this moment inject some psychology into the mix? Because yes. I was thinking about this before we got started. Um, and in listening to the show before, it didn't dawn on me until I was about to be the one answering these questions. So there's this old study in social psychology where uh, people are randomly assigned either to come up with uh, trivia questions to ask another person or to answer the trivia questions posed by someone else. Um, and when you are asking the questions and the other person is answering them, they generally don't do that well, right? Because you're like, I could ask you anything. So like, I'm going to kind of come up with questions that seem reasonable. People aren't going to always know the answer. But here's the trick. (laughs) When you ask people, like, how bright is each person in this interaction, the question asker and the answerer, if you're the question asker, you go like, I'm reasonably bright, this other person's reasonably bright, you know, like, I can't expect them to answer every question I have. But question answers go like, oh, I'm very dumb. Because this person knows the answers to like all these questions. And when people watch these interactions, they go like the an- the asker is smart. The answerer is dumb. <laughs> this is why everyone because... thought Alex Trebek was a genius. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I have, and there's this other problem in the show is that every listener at this point is like, like they know the answer to this, right? At they this don't. The show, only they the, the first, answer. only the first question. Uh, so the okay. rest of these are new information for all of us. Oh, okay. So if I get it wrong, every listener goes like, oh, of course, I would have also gotten this. Incorrect. Cor- correct. Um, uh, also, now you're starting to underwear under. Now you're starting to understand why it was a problem for me to bring on subject matter experts, yeah. <laughs> because it's like, hey, I'm going to bring in this expert on this topic and then make them look stupid, uh, you uh-huh. know, if they don't know these questions. So. Mm. If you don't know these questions, that's because nobody knows these questions. These are these are things that I specifically looked for because I thought they were interesting, not okay, because good. people should know them. OK, good. All pressure is off. So <laughs> what, what, what's inside of a mummy? This is the question. Uh, yeah. So like basically in mummification, they take all the organs out. That's part of their mummi- mm-hmm. mummification process. Uh, and and there, but there was one organ that they left that they left untouched. It was either the brain, the genitals or the heart. So, okay, so what is left inside? Meaning, like, if I were to cut open a mummy that I just found, it would, this would still be there. Yeah, or a powdered version of it, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, somewhere I'd be able to find the brain heart if, or genital if, molecules. If the mummy is that. fresh, this will be easily identifiable. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if that's a clue, because the, the, the trick there is that, like, there are visible external organs and invisible internal organs, and so if you said it'd be easy to notice, it pushes me toward genitals. Although I was I was thinking heart in the sense that like Egyptians would have thought that like that's where the soul is or something crazy. Um, and that's what needed to stick around. So official answer, I'm going to say heart. Andy, not only did you get this one right, but your reason was right. So you are correct. <laughs> Wonderful job. According to the Smithsonian, ancient Egyptians would never remove the deceased heart as they believed it to be the center of a person's being and intelligence. Which I thought was interesting because you would think the brain would be their intelligence, but no, they the heart was where that contained the personhood of of someone. So they left the heart intact, um, and I th- I found that interesting because I don't remember learning that. I do remember learning about mummies in school because the most gruesome aspect of this preparation was the hook that they stick in the nose to pull the brain out. I don't know if you ever remember, oh, remember learning about that. That is familiar now. Yeah, yeah, I remember like thinking that was so gruesome mm. and cool when I was a little kid. Um, but yeah, and they put all the they put all the parts in jars around the room, the heart they leave inside. So you are mm. one for two. 
And uh, I have to tell you something that I'm good at. Mm. Oh, my God. Okay, here's what I, I'm going to go for this. And I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain that this is true. Uh, I, okay. Okay. <laughs> you see here, I'm, I'm like hedging on this. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here it is. Here it is. I'm good at organizing my to-do list mm. out of necessity. If mm. you saw my calendars and my to-do list, it is a long list, um, color coded by category. And I don't put more than three things on my to-do list at a time. Now there might be 20 things on my to-do list, but I have what I call the red list. And the red list is the top three prioritized. When I check one off, I move another one over. Hmm. I, I didn't catch it. This is on paper, or this is uh, in a, on your phone. It's or? it goes. I, I go back and forth on that one. It's been I've I've done both. Um, so you know, I use the reminders list thing on on the Apple products, which is nice. Um, but I also really enjoy writing things down. I generally carry it like a little uh, moleskin mm-hmm. with me, and I like I like writing things down and scratching them off and things like that. So I go back and forth on that one. I'm not consistent. But I am uh, generally like, you know, in terms of the color coding, that's all, you know, obviously that's a phone thing and computer mm-hmm. thing. So, yeah, you can't carry a moleskin and six different pens. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those ones that I had when I was a kid with all the different colors right. that you oh, snap down yeah, from the top. Yeah, yeah p- possibly that would work. Uh, OK, let's keep going here. Um, question three for this question. We're playing for a coveted. The Internet says it's true. Sticker. These are square mm. and sticky and they're extremely valuable. Which one of these statements is true about the mummy of Ramses II, one of Egypt's most famous rulers? So one of these is true. A, his mummy has been issued a passport. B, his mummy is the only one with open eyes. Or C, the mummy was once owned by Winston Churchill. Hmm. So the the answer that I would find the most interesting if it were true is the second one about the open eyes. Because it's the kind of thing that makes you question what you know about mummies. Because <laughs> you're like, oh, are most mummies' eyes closed? What do what? Because the eyes are under the the wrapping paper. That's what they call it, right? <laughs> Egyptologists call it wrapping paper. Yes. Uh, yes, they call it wrapping paper. But for that reason, like it doesn't strike me as the one that's probably right. Like where I lean is the passport one, just for like the logistical issues of like probably it's in the british museum of stolen goods or wh- wherever it might have ended up um and it would have needed some way to get there and so either for legal or hilarious reasons <laughs> they decided to give the mummy a passport so I-, I lean in the direction of passports you are correct once again for the right <laughs> reasons uh so I chose the open eyes because it is a little bit of a red herring because well there's a little bit of truth to something similar they didn't open the eyes they opened the mouth So ancient Egyptians believed that in order for a person's soul to survive in the afterlife, it would need to have food and water. And they did an opening of the mouth ritual um, after they died so they could eat and and drink again in the afterlife. Uh, But uh, and there was no mummy once owned by Winston Churchill. I made that up. I thought it'd be interesting, you know, kind of like a Michael Jackson of his day where he's out Mm -hmm. buying artifacts. But yes, the mummy was issued a passport. It was discovered in 1881 in the Valley of the Kings. His body was flown to Paris in 1974 to be treated, get this, for a fungal infection. And it was Mm. issued an Egyptian passport, and it listed his occupation as king, and then in parentheses, deceased. (laughs) So, yeah, it's the only mummy with a passport. Ramses II. You know, everything I know about this, I've learned in the last week. So I'm I'm no Egyptologist, which is something I probably should tell the people on TikTok because I'm doing I've been doing these videos on TikTok and people are very contentious about uh, wanting to know my sources as if I'm making this stuff up for the fun of it, which I could do. I mean, I could make up total facts, but people are very angry at the fact that I am not an expert in the field, uh, whatever I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Like, no, first of all, I'm a comedy magician. You can read that in my bio. Second, uh, you're on TikTok. <laughs> so, like, not really sure why you're fighting as if this is Facebook. Come on. <laughs> question four. For this question, if you, by the way, you get a sticker. Uh, we'll get that to you mm-hmm. soon. That's a Internet says it's true sticker. Uh, question four. For this question, if you get it right, you have to tell us about your favorite teacher. If you hmm. get it wrong, I'll tell you about mine. Dr. Miles Compound was something that people ingested in the 1830s. I said that as if it was his full name, Dr. Miles Compound. 
Dr. Miles was his name. Compound ah, okay. is what he, Dr. <laughs> Miles is selling. Dr. Miles compound was something that people ingested in the 1830s to treat indigestion, diarrhea, liver disease, and cholera. What would we call Dr. Miles compound today? Is it A, hookworms, B, feces, or C, ketchup? Well, the, those answers were not going down the direction I thought they were. <laughs> I was, my guess was like Pepto-Bismol. I was oh, right. fairly sure that that's where things were headed. Uh, neither of these things are, are Pepto-Bismol. Say, say them again, hookworm. Hookworms, hookworm? feces, or ketchup. And Dr. Miles called this a compound. Whatever it was, none of these are compounds. <laughs> <laughs> I guess ketchup would be the closest to a compound. Um, but that almost seems... It, it, did you say when in time this was? 1830. Yeah, I, I think I definitely know on ketchup then. Um, or if it is, because like ketchup used to be made out of grapes, like OG ketchup was grape based, not tomato based. Um, and uh, so I don't know, this just seems like couldn't possibly be ketchup. And so then I'm in the unfortunate situation of choosing between hookworms and feces. <laughs> this is and, always, it's, it's a popular <laughs> always, conundrum. Your show always comes down to this. Uh, yeah, neither is pleasant and neither is the kind of, Thing you'd want the answer to be and neither seems more or less plausible than the other um and so i think for simplicity just because i i uh, for no good reason i'm gonna i'm gonna land on feces i apologize for your landing on feces but the answer is ketchup believe oh. it or not now miles was not a doctor he was a guy from cleveland that just convinced people that tomato extract could cure many illnesses so um but this is not long after tomatoes were thought to be poisonous so the 1830s, very early in the... Now, I did not find this fact that you're telling me about grapes, about ketchup using, used to be grapes. I didn't know that. I feel like I I, that would make me true. like ketchup even more. Yeah, I think that's true. I know this just because I like canning and stuff. And uh, I came across a recipe for grape ketchup. And the premise was like, this is what ketchup was. So like, wow. let's try to make it <laughs> in the original fashion. But again, this cookbook author may just been, have been lying, right? Just the way that you do on TikTok. <laughs> this is right. <laughs> You're one of those people commenting, aren't uh, you? Oops, gotta go. <laughs> yeah, no, the answer is ketchup. Now, I will say with hookworms, there is an old... Um, episode of it's in an npr show and i i apologize I, I hate this but i can't tell you which show it was about hookworms and a man who harvested hookworms in order to cure allergies mm -hmm. really interesting i will find this and send it to you maybe i'll put it in the I'll, I'll link it in the show notes uh just because i'm now talking about it but he was selling them and got shut down by the f uh, something something what is that the F <laughs> ftc it would be FDA or i think the ftc the, the trade commission shut mm -hmm. him down uh, so now he moved out of the country and and runs his business from another country, it's selling his hookworms elsewhere. <laughs> so yeah, and and the way that he got his hookworms was he went to a country where hookworms were like present around the latrines and mm. stood there in bare feet, got his own hookworms. Uh, he got them, it's cured his allergies, and then harvested them for other people. And yes. The way that he harvested them was from what you thought Dr. Miles' compound was, but it was not feces. He harvested them out of his own feces, and this show has gotten disgusting. Mm. I, I, I think I'm just so happy the actual answer is ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. So, you know, if you ever feel like, you know, you're, you're, you're eating like maybe some fish and chips and you don't feel like you've got cholera, you can, <laughs> you can thank the ketchup that you're dipping your chips in. It's, uh, you know, that's what's doing it for you. Oh, man. And I, I know this feels like it has nothing to do with the episode, but I feel like it does because we're talking about snake oil and disease cures that aren't really cures and old timey medicine. And so that's where that one came from. Hmm. I've never had once until just now felt like I had to explain why I asked a question on the show, but I did. It's funny because I didn't even I wasn't concerned about where it fit in the context of things <laughs> until you had to explain it. I went, Oh yeah, that's right. Why did we? Talk about this? <laughs> yeah, Cause we were so, so we were so deep into Egyptology until this point, right. but yeah, mm -hmm. this was just purely about the fact that old, old generations of people did weird stuff that they called medicine, uh, <laughs> like eating mummies. So we we're down. You're, you're at this point two for four and we're down to the one that's going to make or break you. And it's for all the marbles. So if you get this mm -hmm. wrong, I'm banning you from the show. Andy, you'll never be asked on again. <laughs> Uh, here is your final question. Your podcast, Opinion Science, interviews experts in the field of social psychology, explores why people form the opinions that they do, 
Who is the most fascinating guest you've had on your podcast? Mm. Ooh, that is that is rough. The most fascinating guest. Um, I know it's a tough question, but if you want to be back on this show, you've got to answer it. <laughs> yeah, they're so they they are so very bold. The funny thing is, I feel like people would listen and they're like, "Are they not all the same person?" <laughs> like at a certain level of nuance, you can sort of be like, are, "Is this all? Is this all different?" But I, I don't it is really that. widely varied. Um, you know, the thing that comes to mind is uh, I did a special episode on this project that IBM uh, embarked upon, which was to build an AI system that could debate human beings. Um, and so this this episode of the podcast is occasionally I'll do this where I'll bring in all sorts of interviews and tell sort of a bigger story throughout the hour. Um, and one of the guys that I talked to was the lead engineer at IBM. His name is Noam Slonim uh, in Israel, I think in, in the IBM Haifa office. And, you know, he's just this guy who I, I think the, the most fun fact about him, and I think it ended up in the show, is that he wrote a sitcom with his friend that was picked up and made in Israel. Wow. And then he was like, and then I'll guess I'll go work at IBM <laughs> and I'll propose the next grand challenge. Like IBM only occasionally does these, right? Like, can we beat champion chess players? Yeah. Can we beat like world-class Jeopardy players? And he was like, well, I don't know. I wrote a sitcom and the finale was about debate. So maybe let's make a machine that can debate people. And I don't even think that it, we could actually pull it off. That's <laughs> hilarious. So just the, 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 the mentality of this guy to just kind of float between industries and <laughs> just kind of like, yeah, I thought Be I would do this next. Between him and the president of Ukraine, I feel like TV comedy is a stepping stone career. <laughs> That is what I thought of when I, when I saw the stuff about Zelensky. I was like, oh, yeah, this is like similar. I've seen this story play out before. Not in quite this way. <laughs> I just looked it up. Um, so the IBM chess playing computer was 1995. And so between then and an IBM uh, computer that can, you know, argue with your aunt on Facebook. Now we're talking about quite a leap in AI. Because mm -hmm. chess is a very set set of moves, like specific set of moves. but now. AI to have an argument with someone, man, I feel like it's, well, it depends on what we're arguing about. If you're arguing about politics on Facebook, it might be less moves than chess. Mm. You know, there, there are, you can almost, you can almost uh, predict where someone's going to go based on what's being said and what their politics are, right? But to actually be able to change their mind, right? The benchmark for this machine was oh. like, can its arguments can it change win most a people's minds? Win a debate. Yeah, exactly. Right. So part one is just, can it even come up with arguments? Part two is, can it do so at the level that it can defeat a world champion human debater? That was like the final test of this thing. Um, and so that's what's crazy. So I talked to some of the people who debated against this machine and they say the same thing, like, you know, chess. Yeah. Like there are, there's math, like mathematicians work on chess. Like there are rules. You can only move the piece so many places, but debate is just like, where do you draw the lines? Like, how could you possibly do this? And the fact that they get anywhere even close is yeah. really bizarre to me that well, they could do that. I asked about a fascinating guest and I am fascinated. So you win that question, which means you went uh, three for five. That's great. Three for five, a winning record on the show. And uh, you get a sticker. And uh, you're welcome to come back. That's the that's the real prize uh, is the journey that the friends we made along the way, I guess, is what we should say. Uh, <laughs> please check out Dr. Andy Luttrell's podcast. It's called Opinion Science, and it's available on all of the major podcast platforms. And uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, this was super fun. Thanks for having me. Well, that's all for this week. Thanks to Rob for the topic and to Dr. Andy Luttrell for being my guest. Here's a kid who wants his mummy. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. Don't forget to join up on Patreon if you want to see the unedited video of the guest appearance or to hear bonus episodes. You can do that at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Also, if you learned something that you didn't already know from the show, please visit iTunes and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That's the rule. You gotta do it. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works to get the podcast suggested to more people. And that way we can keep learning something new if the internet says it's true.
the internet says it's true, we'd like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make the show possible. Sean Brown, Catherine Morgan, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Matt McVeigh, Jim Martin, Joanne Martin, and the show's official Emperor Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and additional music this week was from Aaron Kenny and Jesse Gallagher. All audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17, USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Michael Kent.